Carnegie Mellon Quarantine Database Talks are made possible by the Stephen Moy Foundation for Keeping It Real and by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, this is the sort of the kicking off the new semester of the Quarantine Database Talks. Uh, we're excited today to have uh, Sagu, who is the co-founder and CTO of PlanetScale. Um, prior to uh, starting PlanetScale, he helped build the tests uh, at YouTube, uh, which is the sort of the scale of MySQL uh, infrastructure that, that they're commercializing now in, in PlanetScale. Um, so again, we want to thank the, uh, the Steve Moy Foundation for keeping it real, for sponsoring us and, and these sessions. And we'll, we'll do what we do every week. Uh, if you have any questions, please unmute your mic, say who you are, and just interrupt Sagu at any time. We want this to be as interactive as possible. OK? Sagu, All right. the floor is yours. Go for it. Thank you very much, Andy. All right, I actually, Andy may not remember me. I, uh, I think I first met him uh at a percona conference when you was talking about electric sheep oh okay yeah okay <laughs> that was, that was, that was, i'm terrible yes sorry uh but yes uh, uh yeah good to see you again uh so a little bit about me uh so as uh, andy mentioned i am the co-creator of with this i uh, have been working on it since uh, 2010 so it's about 10 years now in 2018, uh, I uh, left YouTube to start PlanetScale, uh, mainly because uh, Vitesse adoption was growing and uh, there was a need for a dedicated company to help work with that. I will talk more about that as we go. Uh, some fun fact about me, um, I was hired by Elon Musk. He probably doesn't remember me anymore, but uh, he did hire me at x.com and we la later merged with PayPal. Uh, that was a fun adventure. I'm actually a big fan of consensus algorithms. Uh, this is also maybe a little known fact that um, uh, I came up with the Flexpaxos idea right around the same time when uh, Heidi and Dalia Malki came up with it. And we kind of... Uh, came together, and if you actually go read their paper, you will see my name quoted in there. Um, I am not an academic at all. I'm a pure engineer. Uh, I will, I'll tell you the story about how it happened. Um, I am actually right now working on a uh, what I would call is a, a more unified approach, because there are things that can be generalized beyond uh, Flexpaxos. I'm actually publishing a blog, blog series. I'll tell you why I'm so excited about this and how I ended up uh, working in this area. I'm also a big fan of Go. I've been working in Go since uh, pretty much most, uh, pretty much the time when it was announced. And we decided to actually implement Vitesse in Go. And Vitesse was the first project to go into production uh, using Go. And for the longest time, we were kind of the highest credibility. When you could say that every time you watched a video, you are using Go code. Uh, that kind of set aside any doubts people had about Go's ability to run in production. Um, I gave a presentation called How to Write a Parser in Go. It, if you Google for How to Write a Parser in Go, mine will be the first hit, so which is uh, kind of cool. Um, although I have no formal compiler uh, background or knowledge, I have worked on a C++ compiler back in 1980 seven, I think, a long time ago. Um, a proud moment is the last blog post that came out of uh, Google Open Source Cloud. Rob Pike quoted me directly as saying, like, if you want to know about why Go, Go is good, uh, please uh, watch Sugu's video about it. It's kind of super cool, you know, Rob Pike talking about my video. Anywho, so that's like some cool stuff. I'm all, uh, so even though I'm an engineer, I do, I am a fan of, uh, some academic people. I'm a, back, a fan of uh, Stonebreaker. I'm a fan of Eric Brewer. I'm a fan of Leslie Lamport, obviously. And uh, I have also seen um, uh, Daniel Abadi and also uh, uh, watched many of Andy's uh, presentations. So a little bit about me. You, you have uh, to do that, right? Like, that's, like, I'd be, uh, sorry? You have to say you, you like Mike and me. Like that's sort of... No, Stonebreaker. I have been a fan of Stonebreaker before you probably, I, I, I would sure. want to say you knew him. I've been a fan of Stonebreaker since year 1990, 
twenty seven. Seven when uh, Informix acquired Illustra. So yes. I was at Informix when they bought oh, Illustra. Okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, I've been a big fan of his data blades. Uh, but yes, yes, I, I actually still um, uh, the Vindex part of uh, Vitas uh, is kind of a steal from uh, the data blade idea, which is where you can actually plug in. Uh, sharding schemes. So that's directly inspired from uh, the Illustra project. Okay, so uh, what is Vitas? Uh, Vitas is a cloud native database. Uh, what that means is that Vitas can comfortably run in Kubernetes. What is cool about it is because people are still afraid to run uh, storage on Kubernetes and Vitas is kind of a pioneer in this area. It is massively scalable. Uh, I will talk about what massive means. Uh, by massive, we really, really mean massive. Uh, highly available, five nines of availability is something that uh, Vitas can comfortably deliver, no problem. And uh, it is MySQL compatible, which means that it uses MySQL underneath and also speaks the MySQL protocol. Uh, so as far as you are concerned, it appears as if you are talking to a giant MySQL database. Actually, this is kind of a marketing slide. It's like, what will Vitas do for me? Uh, under the covers, Vitas, I would say, has three pillars. Uh, one is the query serving part, which means that uh, sharded query serving. You give it a query, it knows how to send that query into a sharded system and get you the results back. On the other side is a um, uh, cool innovation that it has, which we call vReplication which we use for uh, real-time materialization, resharding, and uh, all kinds of uh, uh, data migration uh, workflows that you can build using those. And the third, which is actually uh, the cluster management part, and that is where uh, my, uh, my interest in uh, consensus algorithms uh, came about. Um, so I have never knew about Paxos for the longest time. You know, when I think I might have learned about Paxos in 2013, 14 or so, and I started studying it. The one question that popped up in my mind is, well, people are saying unless you run Paxos, you cannot really have distributed durability. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, at YouTube, uh, we had uh, master databases that were connected to like 75 replicas. And we used to fail over. Out of those, there were 15 of them that we used to fail over to. And we used to fail over quite frequently from one to another. And I hadn't heard of like us losing data. You know? no. And I'm like, so on one side, somebody is saying Paxos is the only way. On the other side, we are running this thing at massive scale, millions of QPS. And it's not like we are, we do have outages and stuff once in a while, but we are not really losing data. So that's when I got interested and started studying. And then I realized that uh, we were running things with a different balance. And that's when I came up with that Flex Paxos idea. Maybe Paxos can be improved. And then later I get an email from uh, Heidi and then Dahlia. And then they say, hey, we are working on the same thing. We should put our forces together. Uh, but now what I'm doing actually in that area is actually found out a few more things that we were doing that don't exist in uh, in the raft or Paxos. So I'm actually coming up with something that is a little more. Uh, so kind of I found out some principles that were driving this design. So I'm I'm uh, started a blog post series about that, uh, which I think uh, is under planet scale. I just posted the first one, which is consensus algorithms at scale. So feel free to follow it if you are interested in this subject. All right. Uh, continuing on uh, with Tess. Uh, uh, where is my present? So Vitesse is uh, a thriving open source project. Uh, it's actually growing. Uh, more and more ad adopters are uh, coming on board. But the best part of uh, more important than these numbers, the most exciting part is who are the people that are using Vitesse? And you can see there's an impressive list of uh, companies. You know? And uh, um, some of these are really, really large scale, but the most staggering one by any measure is JD.com. Uh, JD.com, uh, just to give you a number, uh, last uh, uh, singles day sale, which is their, um, uh, whatever, their Black Friday, 
they finally revealed what was their QPI, Q, uh, peak QPS, 35 million QPS. When people talk about millions of QPS per day, this I was now I, I actually I had to had to confirm multiple times, and then they said, "Well, that's what we run. No, that's that's how much we serve with with that." How, how, okay. how many machines is that? So uh, that's uh, it's all on Kubernetes, which is another miracle, uh, and uh, that is about uh, they uh, the two years ago they told me they were running about forty thousand pods. Uh, of uh, VT tablets. So my guess is that when they serve that QPS, they might have been closer to about 100,000 uh, nodes or so. Um, so that's, yeah. Uh, uh, but they are not the only ones. Slack is pretty much mostly fully ma migrated to uh, Vitesse and uh, I'm sh pretty sure they uh, comfortably serve like a seven figure uh, QPS. And there's Square, which is also a pretty, pretty big workload. Uh, I think they actually, from what I heard, is they grew many fold since the time they uh, migrated to Vitesse in terms of uh, scale. So this is the Vitesse architecture. Um, I'll uh, highlight just a few pieces here. Uh, first thing is what principles did we use to build this architecture? I would say we used three principles, simplicity, um, um, loose coupling, and survivability. Those are kind of the three principles we used. Simplicity means there should be as few components as possible and uh, no less. So in this case, we have the VT gate, which is one component. which We have the VT tablet and MySQL, which is another component. And there's the VT CTLD. And in the serving path, there is only VT gate and VT tablet. In terms of uh, loose coupling, uh, that was actually the hardest part, which is basically uh, each piece does its own work and minimize the surface area that exists between components uh, so that most of these components kind of work on their own. And survivability is basically a way of saying that there is no single point of failure. Any component can fail and the system will continue to operate no matter what. Uh, so those are kind of the three principles. The way we have done this is um, VT gate is mostly stateless, which means that you can scale it up and down. It speaks the MySQL protocol. You can put a load balancer in the front or the app server itself can do its own load balancing. It can connect to any VT gate and to that app server, that VT gate will appear as if this entire sharded system in the back is a single database. It will give the semblance of it. I mean, you can, it's a leaky abstraction of some sort, but generally if you're just sending a query, uh, doing transactions and stuff, it'll look like it's a single database. And uh, the VT tablet itself uh, is kind of tightly coupled with MySQL. What it does is it kind of, it's kind of a minder of that thing. It makes sure that um, it has a connection pool. Uh, it does uh, DBA type of things that Otherwise, like it makes sure that if a query runs for too long, it kills it. It also does housekeeping work like uh, take backups, do restores. So kind of like a um, built-in DBA for that MySQL, for each MySQL instance. And the way this system is tied together is every time a VT tablet comes up, it registers itself with this Topo server. This Topo server could be etcd or Zookeeper or console. And uh, as soon as it registers, these VT gates are watching it. And then when they discover that there's a new VT tablet, they subscribe to it and start sending traffic. So this is kind of at a high level how the system works. So how do these VT gates um, know um, how to split a query, how to send a query to each shard? There is a metadata called V schema in this VT gate that I will talk about, which is uh, parallel to a schema, but it's uh, the V schema describes your sharding scheme, how your tables are sharded, and how uh, and that's what it um, uses as information to route uh, queries. And I'll uh, talk a little bit more about that since that is what this talk is about. Any questions so far? Well, the 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 shard that says big data replica. What is that? Oh yes. So this is actually something uh, something that we had to do at uh, at uh, YouTube. Uh, there was actually workloads that were directly 
served from the web where users would interact. We used to actually send those, many of those things to uh, replicas, not to the master database. But there were internal workloads that were running um, OLAP queries. But those OLAP queries would constantly hit these replicas. As soon as this OLAP query would hit the replica, it would start lagging. And again, it'll cause outage. So what we did was we actually called, um, categorized some of these MySQLs as just for running OLAP queries where you can slam it with any query you like. If it lags, we don't care, uh, but it won't affect uh, the main website queries that are coming from the users. So that is what is this big data replica. Is. And so they're being replicated through like some, like the MySQL log stream or like or what? Like yeah, it, yeah. it doesn't need to be 100 accurate. Like like you can, you can kind of stale. Correct, correct. It can go stale. Uh, it may be lagging by half an hour or so. Oh, okay. You mean yeah. that one? Okay, interesting. Yeah, the we had less tolerance for the actual actual replica queries, like 10 seconds uh, was the tolerance. Whereas a big data replica lag all you want. It's mostly for daily reports and that kind of stuff. All right. And uh, this is what we are doing at uh, planet scale is basically wrapping with us with a warm blanket of the three pillars that I talk about. We take over the two pillars, which is uh, take care of resharding, take care of uh, materializations, and also take care of cluster management. The query serving path remains 100% uh, open source. The idea is that you don't have to be locked in. If you don't like us, you can always pack your bags and move. But uh, we hope that you'll like our service so much that you'll continue to use us. And we make all this available like an RDS, which means that you come in and you click a few buttons and you have a VTS instance up and running. So you don't have to worry about bringing up that. And we'll give you an endpoint and then you start sending queries. So that's basically what we are doing. It's a very sh Briefly, that's what we are doing uh, with Planet Scale. And we are actually the major contributor to Vitesse, and we love our community and uh, continue to uh, push that project along. Who, beyond, is it YouTube still the other major, major con contributor to Vitesse or? Not anymore. Uh, uh, you YouTube, yeah, YouTube has, has not contributed to Vitesse in two years. Because you left. <laughs> yes, I left. Uh, even we, even uh, within YouTube, the last year, 2017, I left YouTube in 2018. All of 2017, I was the only person maintaining with tests until I left. That was another reason why I had to leave. It, it was not scalable that a single person maintain uh, such a huge project. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Actually, so, so, so beyond Planet Scale, who, who, who is the second most contributor? Beyond Planet Scale, who is the second most contributor? Uh, I would say there is a race between, uh, uh, so I have about five engineers that are contributing. Yeah. There's a race between all of them. Uh, and uh, as, as, a, as a company, uh, I would say Slack is probably the second biggest contributor. Uh, Slack, Squire is another big contributor. Uh, others come and go, like GitHub uh, came in and did a slew of contributions and went away. Nozzle did a slew of contributions. They keep coming and going. Uh, the difference is they are all selfish contributors. They need something, so they come in, they do their features for themselves, and then they are yeah. happy. Yeah. yeah. Planet Scale is the only unselfish contributor. <laughs> cool. All right. Uh, seven hours. What does seven hours mean? It's, it's how long it's going to take for me to explain how this query processing works. <laughs> Obviously, I was... Uh, Kidding, but it is there is some truth. Uh, here is uh, somebody asked me how does we call this we call this the V3 design, and somebody asked me I want to contribute to Vitesse. Can you explain how this query processing works? I said okay, I'll explain it, and I started explaining. Did one session, did another session, and basically ended up, it ended up being seven full sessions. But I would recommend you not do it because as you can see, this was the first session. And you see there are 1,600 views. And if you look at the last session, there are 161 views. That is how boring these talks are. So it is not worth watching. But this, has, this explains end-to-end -end how Vitesse query processing works. <laughs>
But so I will try to package this up uh, into uh, something that's more palpable, palpable in the next uh, uh, few minutes. Oh my God, this is a, not a good time for this to happen. It's okay. <laughs> I would, because I, I guess maybe you're in, you're logged in YouTube and your Gmail account and it kicked you out or? No, this is my monthly, you have to log in again. Oh. <laughs> it just happened exactly at this time. Cool. All right. Okay. We are back on track. So that's uh, obviously, uh, it's not going to take seven hours. Um, so uh, to explain how this thing was built, I have to go back in time and show Tell you, talk to you about uh, where we were. I don't know how many of you recognize this image. If you don't recognize, I would highly recommend you Google for MongoDB is web scale. You will find an extremely hilarious video. It was hilarious then because we were laughing at MongoDB then, but they laughed all the way to the bank is all I can say. Uh, <laughs> Give me a shirt too. I have the shirt of the, 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 the one guy who says MongoDB is web scale. <laughs> I, I have a shirt. You have a shirt? Okay. Have a shirt. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, but more importantly, uh, it's more important to know who I was in 2014. In 2014, I was an applications engineer. I was uh, helping YouTube scale. I did not know anything about databases. I knew how to optimize queries. I knew how to do joins. I knew subqueries. I could do a correlated subquery if you kind of uh, put me on the spot. You know, that's, that's basically how I was. You know? And uh, the way we had sharded uh, uh, YouTube was actually put the sharding logic in the application where the application knew where to send a query. You'll get a user ID, it look it up, it says, okay, I'm going to send the select to that particular shard. So this is where we were. And the state of the art was not very advanced either. Uh, we were, uh, Distributed databases did not exist at this time. No, there was no cockroach. There was no spanner. I, I, uh, distributed databases existed since nineteen seventies. Oh yes, yes. Uh, uh, practical. Uh, I mean, in production, distributed databases and open and, source. And open source. Yes, yes. Uh, I, by the way, uh, nothing has been invested in, invented in the last forty years. We have just been recycling those ideas just in better form. Re-implementing re IBM. Exactly, exactly. So, and you will see some of those things when, when, I, ta when I tell you. But uh, the bottom line is I was approaching this problem from the outside. And uh, there is a disclaimer later saying that I probably made a bunch of mistakes. And if you find them, please point them out because um, do not hesitate to call my work a piece of crap. I'd love it because at the end of the day, uh, if you find something that can be fixed, I want it fixed. But this is more like, this is how we did it. This is where we came from. This is how we did it kind of thing. So uh, you may not, you may see some, uh, some big holes in what I have done. But the fact is we did get it working. So that's, that's the cool part. So the way, the way I reasoned about this is, you know, if the app is sending query to a shard, there is something that the app is using to figure out where to send it. So how, did the, how does the app know where to send a query was kind of the first question I asked myself. And like the app receives a request from the web, it has a user ID, and it says, based on the user ID, I'm going to apply a hashing algorithm and then send it to a shard. Well, if you're doing that, you're also including that user ID in a where clause. So I said, what if we flipped it to, flip this around, right? What if you just gave me the query, and I knew that you have a where user ID equal to X, I will apply the hashing and send you the query. So the idea, like this is all like super new to us, you know, we, we were like uh, systems engineers who were like worried about scalability. So the question is like, oh, well, you got this query working. How about something else? How about this? How about videos? How about joins? So I don't know. We should, we should, we should explore this idea. You know, that's what you we were thinking. And how are you going to like write something generic that will work at YouTube scale? You know, those are these were the challenges. So I started studying. You know, this was my like. If your dad asked you like, like uh, how to draw, like can you draw me a house? This was my picture of how a database worked. You know, this was my first diagram. You know? I said, well, this is how a database works in my eyes. The CPU, there is RAM. 
uh, there is a schema that tells you what tables are there. And there are tables which are physical files, there are index files, and uh, this is my view of how a database works. Uh, the CPU says when a query comes, it looks up the schema, figures out if that query is good, and using the schema, it knows the indexes. Uh, the indexes has some uh, pointers into the tables, there are constraints, and then what it does is it loads things into the RAM uh, as it reads them, applies locking uh, logic as needed to for your uh, transactions and stuff. Uh, so this was my high level view. And of course, there's like uh, logs and stuff which I'm not concerned with because the reason why I drew this picture is to compare with uh, what I had with uh, Vitesse here. Right? So this is how Vitesse works. Vitesse has this VT gate as you saw there, right? And behind VT gate, there's a sharded data, uh, there's a bunch of shards. And then there are some lookup databases that points to these shards. And uh, what if I took the schema idea and built a V schema that described how these sharding worked? And now I'm saying, oh my God, these two pictures are starting to look alike. So maybe this can be the start of a distributed database. So this is essentially how it was born. During those days, we debated uh, using a centralized row cache. We never implemented it, but uh, this architecture does allow for that. Maybe someday we will. Was so it, it, this- Did you not implement it for engineering reasons or was there something fundamental about, about like, because getting a row cache right is tricky. Oh yes, so we actually built, uh, we actually had a row cache built, but it was at the VT tablet level. Okay. Uh, but the problem was uh, going through two hops to reach a cache didn't make sense. So we actually deprecated that thing and with the intention of rebuilding it on this side. But we don't know if, if it will actually work, whether it's solvable. Uh, it felt conceptually similar to this. So we think that maybe there is, there is hope there. But okay. we haven't spent time uh, figuring out how it will work out. But I do have hope because I got a row cache working uh, at the VT tablet layer. Uh, so I think uh, I think it'll work uh, as long as it's an eventually as an uh, as an eventually consistent cache is how I got it working. So you have to basically say that I am doing a dirty read. Uh, so, uh, but it was a cache that was invalidated by subscribing to the bin lock stream of the database. All right. Um, so this, so this idea gave me hope. You know? So I started out saying, and then what I decided to do was, I said, I am going to now read up. No, I'm going to learn how databases work. Guess what? There is not much information to read, uh, or at least I could not find much information to read. I mean, there were a lot of theoretical things that talked about how an engine worked, but they were too theoretical for me. Uh, I tried to read the, the MySQL code base, the Postgres code base, a SQLite code, code base. Like the problem is these people who designed these engines uh, had, didn't really write a design document about how they did it. Uh, it was hard to find. And so, and then uh, I think I found some literature using SQLite. Uh, but at the end of the day, my conclusion was they are too uh, centered around how the database itself worked and wasn't applicable to what I was trying to build. So, okay, we must go deeper, you know? So went deeper and started studying relational algebra. Uh, studied relational algebra uh, and uh, I, I actually got some good insights from there, but it wasn't enough for me. It was enough for me to get started, but I had to come up with my own version. That's essentially what I ended up with. And which is uh, basically, this was my uh, my outcome. By the way, I during this time, uh, it took me about a month to learn all this knowledge. You know, to absorb all this knowledge, I was mostly staring into space. <laughs> it was uh, it was kind of uh, funny, and I came up with this uh, with this uh, design document, which uh, you can find. Uh, let me see if I can uh, do it. And uh, so this is so this is basically my self brainstorm about what SQL is, uh, what are the problems. Uh, see, there's SQL for dummies. This is how a query works. And eventually, I said, you need nine operators to satisfy 
any select query. You know? So, and I said, this is very driven, very influenced by a select statement. Uh, but uh, it is more practical about uh, if you have to send a query to a database, you need all these these nine. The, with using these nine, nine operators, you can uh, satisfy any query. There is probably overlap between them, but practically speaking, these nine, I felt that they were needed. And, uh, and the other thing I noticed about uh, between uh, and the thing I was I got this got me really excited. Uh, the relational algebra part is that these things are all interchangeable. You know, you can do a select before a filter, a filter before a select. I started like building all this commutativity and associativity rules about what the thing is because they all took results as input and produced results as input. So that got super exciting. The only exception was a table scan. The table scan did not take a result as input. So at the leaf node of all these things were these table scans that produced your original, your first result, after which then you applied uh, these transformations. You know. But there was a twist, which is uh, the relational primitives, uh, uh, the scalar primitives. Uh, SQL is not just relational operators. It has scalar primitives. And the stuff that really, really sucked here for me was subqueries no a subquery can be reduced into a scalar and that just like my head just exploded i could not contain this combined complexity i just left that aside and i will tell you how i managed to work with it and uh, so uh, essentially my disclaimer is this may not be this the best approach but this is what i did to get get this working in vitas but before I go into how I uh, broke this problem apart, I had to give myself some design constraints. I hope I'm not running out of time. Okay, I think I still have time. You're good. Cool. So the the one design constraint, I, I some pe people have questioned me on this, but I think this has paid off, is queries must be recognizable, which means that if application sent a query and Vitesse said, okay, this query essentially can run unmodified by a single shard or can be sent to all shards, that query should mostly be recognizable, should mostly look like the query that the user sent. Uh, the other one was called what I call as a stable plan, which means uh, that if a query, if I determine that uh, a query is potentially a multi-shard query, but uh, all the rows for that query can be satisfied by a single shard, uh, the plan that I built was still a multi-shard plan. And people challenged me on that, say, why would you make a query that was satisfied, that could be satisfied by a single shard, a multi-shard plan, just because in principle, logically, it is two different potential shards. The reason was actually simple, because you may be running this query in a test environment where there are only four shards. And the test, during your test, it'll say, ah, I can satisfy this query by just running it in a single shard. Your production may have 256 card shards. So suddenly your profile is going to look very different when your query runs in a fully sharded environment. So for that, just to support that use case, uh, I made the decision that it is safer to always treat potentially, a query that could potentially go multi-shard as a multi-shard queries, because you don't want to get burned when you take this uh, query into production. Like, what is the, like, this is complex, right? Because like, what, what is the cutoff? Like, if, if, yes, like, so I, for I, this, I, I would, uh, the way I would do it is, so the, the Vitesse model is actually, um, we, we have this, uh, we define this key space, and we have key space IDs. And every row has a key space ID. So, uh, and if two rows have the same, same key space ID, they are guaranteed to be in the same shard. If they have different key space IDs, even if they are in the same shard, I treat them as if they could be in different shards. So that was actually the tipping point. But, so, uh, so it, the, but then when you execute it, you would actually use... Oh, it will go to the same shard. But from a transactional perspective, from a join perspective, Got, it okay, won't okay. push that query down into a, as a single join inside that chart. It'll fetch the query and then fetch the other one. Uh, 
Ah, okay, okay. In production, yeah, in production, you may actually end up uh, doing it, and you want that behavior to be seen even when you're testing. So somebody asked a question, uh, just to clarify on that, if a write query resolves to two different key space IDs, it, it will execute as a distributed transaction without perfect atomic guarantees. Uh, that is actually, uh, uh, it will, uh, so that is, uh, it, at the transaction level, it still merges them together as a single transaction. Got it. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, but yes, uh, but most likely, if you go in, if you take that into production, it will actually split. You are likely to split that into two transactions, and they will uh, they will become uh, different transactions uh, distributed uh, as a transaction. And uh, Vitesse does not support two PC yet very well. The, we have an implementation, but we don't. Uh, there are some people who have tested it, said that it is good, but I haven't seen anyone use it in production. And the reason is, I, I won't go too much into the reasons, but the main reason is because Vita, uh, Vitesse allows you to group things that are related into a single shard. Uh, and that's how most people have avoided distributed transactions in Vitesse. The other uh, uh, decision I made is that it has to be a single pass, which means that I start with the query, I go, 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 and by the end, I am done. Uh, my plan is built. I don't. I never trace back. I don't. I don't redo. This was actually a weakness of mine. The reason why I did it this way was not actually a design constraint. It was uh, how I implemented the symbol table. When I tried to understand the symbol table, I realized that uh, it has so many scopes. When you analyze the from clause, there is a scope. When you analyze the on expression, there is a scope. The where clause has its own scope. And uh, so the way I designed the symbol table was that the symbol table evolves over time. Uh, the symbols it resolves is always based on the latest scope that it has entered. So once you have entered the latest scope, you cannot ask it a, a query about something you like when you're doing when you're doing and you're resolving symbols of a group by. Uh, you cannot start resolving, you cannot go back to the scope that you were when you were analyzing a from clause. So, because when you analyze a from clause, uh, the symbols you saw were very different. So, uh, to simplify uh, the design of the symbol table, I made it a single pass, which means that as I kept analyzing, I analyzed in a very specific order where the symbol table kept growing and changing its behavior. And uh, the only way I did was by just moving forward and never going back. I don't know if that makes sense. It is probably a mistake. Uh, one of our uh, latest people, Andres, is saying, no, you don't need to have done this. I'll give you an alternate uh, uh, design for this. So I'm waiting for uh, his proposal to, uh, to make this a multi-scoped uh, symbol table. And the, the bigger complication I, would, I was dealing with, uh, I was still trying to wrap my head around what does it even mean to have a uh, subquery? You know? The subquery uh, has symbol, uh, references symbols. Those symbols can go to the outside query. And, when, and that subquery can be inside the where clause. If it's inside the where clause, it has its own scoping rules. Like, this is all I could deal with. I said, okay, I'm locking this down, keeping this simple. And this allowed me to get past the problem of resolving symbols. Another cool thing I did, I think this was cool, but now, now we are changing it, is uh, the question that I would ask myself is, if, I, if you just threw a query at me, can I describe what it does without knowing what the schema is? The answer is mostly yes except if you did something like, uh, if you did a select star from A join B, or select column from A join B, I wouldn't know whether this column came from A or B. But you could say, well, you could say select A dot call from A join B, then I would know what it is. So then I said, the query has to be self-explanatory, which means that if there was ambiguity, you need to resolve that ambiguity by qualifying those column names using the table name. So using that, uh, the constraint I made was the VT gate does not need to know the schema of the target shard. It needs to be able to know what to do with that query without knowing the schema. And uh, 
we got this working, it works. Uh, there are some queries that still fail, but there are some experiences that are not great. For example, if you did an insert, you had to give the column list. You know? Otherwise, I won't know what is where. So there were some things that were difficult. The VT gate, like, you're sending what? You're sending, like, SQL query come, shows up, and then you send another SQL query to the, to the shard? So the SQL, the SQL query comes here from the app server. Yes. It goes to VT gate. Yes. And VT gate has no knowledge of what these VT tablets have. So you're not manipulating the SQL query like like, like the MemSQL guys, I think the Citus guys did something similar. Like you're just, you're basically just routing it. Like you should go Exactly. Here. Yeah, yeah. I am trying to figure out where to send the query. And can I figure out where to send the query without knowing the schema? Yeah, okay. So that, that is the constraint. So it I, wasn't, I got about 90% out there and the other 10%, the people, the app, the uh, the application people had to rewrite their queries in such a way that VTGate can figure out what to do with it without knowing the schema. But now we are changing this where the VT tablets are going to start sending their schema to the VTGate so that they can be uh, smarter about how to send this query. Okay. All right. So using, uh, let's see. Uh, and uh, finally, this was my final out, you know, if it was too difficult, I said, well, I don't handle it. You know? So we had this out and there is still a bunch of queries that we don't handle. We actually just made a decision saying that we are now far enough that we can basically shoot for the finish line. We are going to actually make 100% of the queries work because we know how to make all of them work using this architecture. So we are going for the finish, finish line here. Okay. So back to here, uh, what strategy did we did I use? So the only replacement I made was a scan is replaced by what I call a route. What is a route? Route is a special primitive that works like a scan, except that it can do all nine of those operations, which means that a route, because at the end of the day, what we have underneath is a full relational engine, right? Which means that you can make a route to any of these nine primitive works. What are the restrictions? The restrictions are that a route can only send a select query. Right? It can only send SQL, uh, which means that you cannot give it primitives. It doesn't know how to deal with primitives. It can only say, execute this select statement to this database. And the scope of a route is limited to a single database. So with that, uh, I replaced scan with route. And uh, uh, initially, I only implemented join and left join. And later, we implemented select, aggregate, sort. We still have not uh, implemented filter, merge, and uh, scalars. And you will be surprised at how much workload we can, how many of the existing workloads we can handle. The reason is because we have MySQL behind us. Anything that we don't know how to do, we usually just give it, outsource it to MySQL, make MySQL do the work, and only what MySQL cannot do, uh, we do, right? So we have been able to get away with not, with VTGate not being a full engine for these many years, with these many people going into production and running with us, um, just because of the fact that we have a full relational engine behind us. So, uh, so this is kind of my uh, poor man's view of how a traditional engine does its planning. There is SQL, it converts it to an AST, takes the AST, builds some relational opcodes, and then runs through an optimizer and builds some DB-specific opcodes that are not in the original relational list. The way I changed this was, I'll start with an SQL, build an AST. For me, uh, oops, I went to the next one. Uh, the way the Vites AST is designed is SQL and AST are reversible. I can take an SQL, build an AST, and from the AST, I can go back to SQL. But uh, the opcodes, you could not go back to a, at least a decent SQL, uh, given a bunch of opcodes, because they were a little more unwieldy. Even if you could go, I didn't have the confidence that the SQL that one would generate, uh, the a correct SQL that represented this operation by these opcodes 
would be uh, would have may have uh, selects from selects and that kind of stuff, which I would, didn't have the confidence that an engine would optimize that well. So I, the way I designed it was that I will go from SQL to AST, and while I did these opcodes, I will keep those AST elements that brought about these opcodes with those opcodes, and then at the end, when I did the final generate, this AST will generate back the SQL. So that was kind of the high level approach. In reality, there was only one such hybrid opcode, which was the route. Everything else uh, were pure relational opcodes. It's a realization that we had uh, much later. Okay. Uh, so the other question that was like, how much, when I got a query, how much should we get to and how much of the work do we give to MySQL? The answer here was simple. If MySQL can do it, give it to MySQL. I mean, 25 years of tuning has gone into making MySQL really, really good. So do not reinvent the wheel, give the work to MySQL as much as possible. I call this push down. And, uh, if, and if it is single shard or single key space, send everything there. The only time when you break a query up is if it's a join, it's a cross shard join, cross shard join, in which case you have to split the work and only do the leftover wire up uh, yourself, uh, which is the, the third strategy. So determining the target shards. So there, are the, so there are some easy answers, right? If somebody send me a select query to an uncharted database, which means that there is only one shard, it's a brain dead thing, just send it to the uncharted route. If you send select star from a sharded table, this is also brain dead. Basically send the queries to all shards and return all the results. This is a very simple one. Here's another simple one. Uh, if, uh, so the way the V schema works is um, the V schema allows you to define uh, what, uh, what people call in the key value store as a sharding key, but we are relational people, right? I call it the primary index, the primary with test index, which is like a primary key, uh, which means that it has all the cool properties of a primary key, which means that every table has to have one and it has to have a unique value. Uh, it has to be non-null, so all those cool things, which means that uh, the value of the primary key must be specified on an insert because that will be used to identify where this row is going to live, and that's where the row goes. And if ID was your primary index, uh, but there is a difference because at the end of the day, um, a primary index is not the primary key. That's an extremely important property. It is the place where the row lives, but in reality, uh, the primary key could be different. And it is uh, why is that important? Is because if you have a master detail table, like you have, uh, if you have users and their orders, you want the orders to live with their users. Users. So the order table has an order ID and a user ID. The user table has user ID. So the primary index for a user table will be user ID the primary index for the order table will also be the user ID, even though it's not the primary key. But that will ensure that the orders of a user live with their users. So if I then issue a join of a user with an order, then it's an, the entire join can be sent to that chart. So that is basically the secret behind uh, with test sharding. Does, does any query turn into like multiple queries? If I, if I have like nested select, you like when you go to the, to your own opcodes, are you breaking that apart and routing individual things, or is it like do you always it's either you know uncharted or or, or these three modes? That's like a very much, good question. How yeah. much massaging yeah. of the query are you doing? I try to do zero massage. My goal is to is to preserve the original query as as much as possible. Uh, the SQL comes. I, I actually I'll actually show you an animation at the end. The thing that Vitesse tries hard is try really, really hard. Can I really, really, do I really, really have to break this query up into two parts? If I don't have to, I am not going to uh, do it. If there is, for example, a subquery, and if it is correlated, and this correlation is on the primary index, that subquery can, need not be broken out, for example. If there is a join, and if there is not just the primary index, any unique index. So Vitesse has a primary index. It also has secondary indexes, which has cross-shard indexes. 
and those could be unique. And if they are unique, that actually means that uh, if I do a join on a unique secondary index, that is still a single shot query. And uh, Vitesse works very, very hard at making sure that your query is never broken into parts. Only when forced to, uh, it does. Uh, somebody actually threw me a challenge. Uh, I think they, now looking back, I think they would have won, but they didn't win that time. Uh, was that, oh, do you think you can figure out every query, uh, every query that I think is, that I believe is a single shot query, do you think you can figure out? I said, yeah, I think I can do it. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but the, the use cases that they had, which is actually satisfied, but uh, there were some cases where application knew more than uh, the metadata in the V schema. Can, can, can you give an example of that? Like, like what aspect of it made, made it difficult to route? Uh, so there are, uh, so the, the aspect that made it difficult to route is uh, there are foreign key relationships that are maintained by the application, for example. Right, the application knows that this is a foreign key to that, and if you don't specify that as a relationship, then Vitesse doesn't know. Actually, Pinterest had that uh, situation where they had this use case. <laughs> what they did was they created a fake, uh, unique index on those two columns uh, that actually never resolved, and they used that index only for joins, and they managed to actually convince Vitesse of these. Uh, of these joints. So that's a cool thing that they did. All right, I have five minutes left and I'm not even, uh, let me let me rush quickly. Uh, so these are some, some more example, let's uh, skip through this. Let me, give you, let me give you a cool animation. Uh, so here is a query. Uh, here is a query uh, where the input is a select statement and I build an AST from it. Uh, the AST, the way, uh, this, the way this AST is represented is the from clause is at the bottom. This is your on clause. This is your where clause. On the top right is your uh, select list. And these are the post-processing group by having order by and limit. So this is kind of the AST that we built. And uh, this is the process I go through. Uh, the best model I can describe to you is think of this as a pachinko machine where you take this AST elements and throw them into this pachinko box of primitives. And these AST elements try to make their way into one of these leaf nodes. If they get stuck, then they become a primitive themselves. If they don't get stuck, they will eventually end up in one of these routes. So in this case, I start, uh, I've, uh, I start with my analysis. I say, okay, here is my select. I'm starting with the from clause. And the from clause is a recursive one because uh, a join there is a left hand side and the right hand side. So the left hand side says, I have analyzed your A. Uh, what can I derive from A? The only thing I can derive from A is that it's basically a full scatter query of all rows of the table. That's what you can, that's all you can do right now with the information that you have. Okay, so let's build a select statement which scans all rows from A. So my route is an opcode, it's a primitive. As you know, this is a super primitive that can perform any SQL. And this, it's a scatter, which means that you send this query to all shards, uh, the user is the name of the database. Okay. And uh, the same analysis happens for B, and B says, here is a route, it's a full scatter scan of uh, table B. Okay. And the two actually meet at join. So the join says, oh, I need to put these two together. So at that time, the join look at this join condition and it says a.id is equal to b.id. This is a join on a primary index, which means that these two routes can be merged into one. So it says, all right, I'm going to put them together and push this join down. And now I've rewritten the select AST where the join A, B, along with the on clause and the select have become one. This has now become a single route. What if I had a join that was not on a.id equal to b.id, right? On some random column, some completely unrelated expression. Then what it would have done is uh, the pachinko machine, right? It tries to push it down, but the two routes cannot be merged. Therefore, I now have to create a new primitive, which is a join primitive, which will 
uh, then have to perform this join of a dot n equal to b dot n. This is where another one of the coolest inventions that we did with this was, should this join condition do a dot n equal to b dot n? Right? Uh, we said no. What we are going to do is this entire on expression, we are going to push it down into the RHS, the right hand side of the query. So what we are going to do is, uh, I'm going to put this a, push this a dot n equal to b dot n through this, and this route is going to do it. But this is invalid right now, which is why a dot n is uh, highlighted as red, because there is no a dot n in this route. So you'll say, we'll resolve this later. But for now, we are going to push that. I call this the rightmost rule, which means that any sub-expression that uh, needs to be pushed down into a route, you always push it to the rightmost route that refers to it. So in that route, uh, I'm now I go to the uh, a dot id equal to 5, says, oh, a dot id equal to 5, the rightmost route says, uh, oh, OK. So and uh, here I did something, another important one, is that this is now a single shot query. Right? Single shot query because I'm saying this is essentially b dot n equal to uh, sorry, no, it's not a single shot query. It's a name query. So there is a secondary index, so I need to use that secondary index. So that's basically, this plan has improved. It is not a full scatter anymore. It is basically look up a secondary index and then use that here. And now I'm going to push a dot id equal to 5. And a dot id equal to 5, as you see, did not end up on the right-hand side because the rightmost rule says that a dot id equal to 5 belongs to the left-hand side of this route. And uh, and then as soon as I push this, I said, hey, I've added a constraint, which means that I can probably improve, improve the plan. My plan is now a, is that this that used to be a scatter query becomes a single shot query. I'm accelerating because I'm unfortunately out of time. A lot of time could be spent uh, uh, doing this. And then I go to the select uh, statement. In the select statement, I just keep pushing them down. In this case, it's a straightforward. Actually, it's not a straightforward push down. A dot ID and A dot A1 go to the left, but B dot B1 goes to the right. And this is essentially a nested loop join. It's going to fetch rows from the left-hand side. And what it is going to do is supply the value for A dot N to the right-hand side. And that is the final wire up that I have to do is after I have built all this, I go to these things and look for symbols that are unresolved, you know? And when I look at an unresolved symbol, I said, oh, a dot n is unresolved. Okay, let's go find out where that a dot n is. By the rule of the rightmost, I know that it's one of the left-hand side expressions. So I go look at the left-hand side expressions and say, okay, do you have a dot n? Okay, if so, you need to supply that to me. So then we find it in uh, route zero. So route zero provides a dot n. And join says, please, when you get a row from here, uh, populate the value for a dot n. We are calling it a bind variable, which is a underscore n, and supply that here. And then this executes uh, the join. It's not very efficient if it's a pure nested loop join, but that's what we do for now. Uh, we are now going to make some improvements, uh, which is uh, uh, change this to a block nested loop join on one case. There are cases where if this constraint is a constraint that's likely to scan this entire table on the right hand side, why not do a sorted merge? So that's another thing that we are looking at. Hash join is another one that we are going to do. So there's there's uh, things that now that uh, Andres, who has done these things, is uh, suggesting all these cool improvements that we are going to do. Um, yeah, to, to understand this, like, so this would execute as two queries plus something in the test that's doing the nested loop join. So the way this is, uh, the green stuff is VTGate. Okay, okay. So the query comes to VTGate. It says, I'm going to do a join. So this join, this is this is actually a horrible query if it's a no lap query. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. fine if you're doing, if you're yeah. fetching one or two rows. Because yeah. for every row it gets from the left, it does a lookup on the right. Okay. Uh, so it's, but it, uh, it turns out that there are people who want just to fetch one or two rows like this. But, but so, so the VT gate is doing more than routing, right? Like, yes. Yeah, this is like it's, it's doing a, a join. It's it's actually both a router and an engine. Got it. Uh, okay. It works hard at being a router, and it's a very horrible, inefficient engine, but that can still satisfy your query. 
Um, and sorry, and the VDK is doing all this without knowing the schema, right? And any other information regarding the underlying shards, data, and etc. That it knows. So VTK has the V schema. It knows which shards there are. It knows the shard ranges for each. So it knows that a query has to be sent to this shard. It knows, like for example, where a table lives, right? It knows that a table is in this key space or is in this shard, um, in this key space. And based on the where clause, it knows that this, uh, based on this where clause, I need to send this query to that shard of the key space. So that is what it knows. But not uh, <laughs> like that's the reason why you see a dot id here because if you had just said id, uh, VTGate wouldn't know whether that id came from a or b. So actually, there is a there is a little bit more. Uh, I the, this I, I talk about the simple table, but it is uh, uh, I would say it is uh, not worth it. The the this this part is actually what killed me the data model uh the juggling of three data structures three three different worlds of data structures that had point that were pointing to each other was i would say extremely painful but this is essentially the data model uh the simplified data model uh, of what i had to use to build this engine uh, so i can you can answer questions more specifically in here if you want, but uh, but if you think through it from uh, uh, basic principles, uh, each one of these relationships would make sense. So that is all I had uh, presentation-wise. Uh, some of some links here. I'm I'm open to questions. Okay, awesome. I will applaud on behalf of everyone else. Uh, so Hardik, you. There's a question that they had during the talk. You want to ask that now? Is that person still here? Uh, yeah. So say who you are. Where are you coming from? Yeah. So, so I uh, don't have the question related to the query plan, but like initially when you touched on the big data part, and usually, so basically, what is your view on using MySQL for OLAP versus using databases which are optimized for OLAP? And at what scale do you say that, okay, MySQL don't do it anymore and it is not cost effective to do that? So actually, that's a, that's an awesome question. Um, I have actually, uh, you can quote me saying completely contradictory things about this at different points of time in my life. So there was a time when I said uh, OLAP queries are best served by OLAP systems, you know, columnar systems. Mm -hmm. And at some point of time, I said, why, what? You can use MySQL to to serve any OLAP query, and I proved that at YouTube. We actually used to run map reduces on these MySQLs and mm -hmm. satisfy anything that people wanted. Mm -hmm. It well, it is true. So, in other words, you can use MySQL to do OLAP queries, but I don't think it was the best use of MySQL. Not in not in all those cases. Mm -hmm. But today, looking back, the answer is. There is actually a category of queries that even OLAP systems cannot satisfy, mm -hmm. even as OLAP system, because of the fact that they are columnar. The big mm -hmm. problem they have is they, not, they cannot do real time. Uh, they, like if you're doing a high QPS throughput and you yeah. want to do real time reporting, you cannot get that from an OLAP system. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where the third pillar, uh, the second pillar of uh, uh, Vitesse comes in. What mm -hmm. Vitesse can do is uh, it can materialize your OLAP uh, data into um, uh, what you call folded, uh, uh, I'm trying to uh, find the correct term, aggregated results real time. Like for example, it can keep a table up to date about what's your total sales per product, you know? So that kind of, that kind of stuff Vitesse can do. Those fall actually between a full OLTP system and a full OLAP system. Those are, there's an in-between category that is actually, it's a big gap and many people actually uh, hate both worlds because they cannot get an OLTP system to answer those queries. They cannot get an OLAP system to answer those queries. Those I believe uh, fall back at us at uh, where I believe we just can fill that gap where it can do re oh, real-time roll-ups. That's the word I was looking for. It can do real-time roll-ups for you that can give you, uh, like, uh, using which you can build dashboards and stuff like that. 
but there is a lot of overlap right so this using these real time roll ups it encroaches into olap territory so if a single system can meet all your requirements you can avoid the complexity of having a running a separate olap system yeah also one more benefit i feel is like if you shard enough you can actually get the power of parallel processing like if you shard enough you can get the parallel processing power for olap queries correct correct yeah the i think the bottom line is uh, efficiency right it's it, it speed is not a problem if you can provision uh, like you can shard it wide and it, it can go screaming fast uh, the it's the efficiency i mean the olap engines are going to do compression and a bunch of things that mysql is not going to do well i mean you could you could use the maria db column store stuff uh, but I, i don't know how well that 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 compares against um i was in vertica but all or snowflake a bunch of the other sort of specialized olap systems um all right we have time for one more question i apologize for for being late because of the class and anybody else okay yeah i got one question go for it lena um so um is is ast transformed back to sequore at wikigate Oh yes we actually get convert uh, sql to ast back and forth in multiple places in vitas vtgate is only one of them vt tablet has its own uh, query processor does its own things uh, because it can do cool stuff there are features that it that i didn't talk about that requires vt tablet to parse the query also uh, so we do some cool stuff there so we convert uh, back and forth uh, sql to ast and back uh, all the time in vitas in multiple places um and is is transferring back to sql required by the mysql instance yes mysql only understands sql so at the right. we have to uh, uh convert it back to sql and mysql is going to do its own uh parsing but mysql parsing is hyper efficient it is uh, almost negligible cost compared to all the other work it does so it has never uh bothered us that it was doing it Got it. Thanks. So uh, this sounds similar to what MemSQL does. MemSQL query shows up, they figure out how to break it up and send it to different shards, and then they uh, then they convert it back to SQL. But then they they have their own SQL dialect, and when they send it to to the to the shard nodes, that tells it to do things like, don't send data back to the the core data, or in your case, I guess the V gate. They send it to other other nodes in the clusters. They do sideways information passing. Um, all right, so I, I will ask you one last question that I'll ask everyone else. Uh, how stupid are, are your users? And you can be as vague as you want or very specific. Like, like, are you shocked at the stupidity of people using the test, or do you find that your users are somewhat sophisticated? Because you have to sort of know that you you need something like the test before you know you even start talking to you. They come in all categories. Um, but uh, the way I would qualify stupid is uh, many of these users that come. deal with legacy decisions that were made before uh very often their requests <laughs> feel stupid but then if you go back and say why are you doing this at all with <laughs> with your query right say i can't do it it's like it's been there and i have to make that work <laughs> you know so um that's fair uh, yeah so but okay. they are, yeah yeah okay awesome all right again i i thank you for for staying late with us i really appreciate this this is super awesome this is a good exposure uh to again what what the test is doing and it's it's interesting to see like what you can do like like you know purely at the router level the vt or the vgate level before you can touch the data system so th this is a different way to think about data system so this is this is exciting so again thank you for being with us